Hey, it's Jamie from Gilbrook Farm, and we're gonna finally get around to the video you guys have been waiting for, which is how to can roasts. I've been talking about how wonderful canned meat is, and in particular, how wonderful roasts are, and I know a lot of you guys have been like, where's the video? The thing is, is I had canned, oh, I don't even know, probably about 90 pounds of roast the last time I canned it. It lasted me just about a year, and we're finally just now getting down to where I have, I think, maybe four quarts and three pints of roast left. So it is time to can some more up. So here is the much anticipated how to can roast video. You guys are going to be shocked at just how simple this is, and honestly, uh, of all the different canned meats that I have tried, canned roast is by far the best. Now, a lot of you guys have also asked if you can can uh, other meats such as venison this way. Absolutely, I'm gonna give a few tips as I go through the process as to what to do if you're canning things like venison. Uh, but for right now, let me just go through what you're going to need to can your roasts. All right, so what do you need to get started? Well, the very first thing you're going to need is a pressure canner. This is completely different than a pressure cooker. If you guys are brand new to canning, I'm going to refer you to our Canning 101 video, which covers all the basics of canning, uh, which is really important because uh, we're gonna answer a lot of questions in that video that we're not going to cover in this video. So after you watch that one, then you can come back over to this video and learn how to can roast. Now my canner uh, is the All American 921. That holds seven quart jars or 14 to 16 pint jars. 14 to 16 just depending on if you use wide mouth jars or if you use the regular mouth jars. Uh, for this particular video, I'm going to can my roasts in quart jars. You can also can them in pints as well. There will be a different processing time if you do use pints, uh, but I do can them in both. Um, I actually prefer to can them in the quart jars though because I use uh, the quart jars more for making a meal. The pint jars are more for like making sandwiches. So you're going to need your seven uh, quart jars if you're using the All American canner or another canner that has seven quarts. I use the wide mouth jar because it's just easier to get the meat in and out. And for my recipe, I use fresh onions in the bottom of the jar. This is completely optional. You don't have to use fresh onions. Um, you can also use dehydrated onions if you have those. And if you don't want to use onions at all, you don't have to use onions at all. This just really adds to the flavor in my opinion. The next thing you're going to need is some sort of spice. I like to use a steak uh, seasoning. This is called Montreal steak seasoning. I think the name's pretty generic. I've seen it in several different spice stores. I have purchased mine from Azure Standard. Um, Azure Standard is just where I buy a lot of my bulk supplies. If you guys are interested in that, I'll leave a link to um, an article on my blog where I talk about Azure Standard. But uh, the Montreal steak seasoning is a salt and pepper blend. And uh, it's really good for steaks. It's a wonderful steak blend and it's all like non-GMO and natural and all that. Um, one thing to note, a lot of people ask about spices and if they can use any spice that they want. You, you can. Uh, the problem is, is a, a sage can tend to give an off flavor to some of the meats. This is something that I've read about. It's not something that I have personally experienced. I read about it before I started canning and so I've never tried it because I didn't want to ruin any of my meat. Uh, but just be careful if you're using anything with sage, you might want to try and avoid that. You're also going to need lids. Uh, wide mouth lids to go with the wide mouth jars. Um, I do reuse my lids. Again, if you guys are interested in knowing why I do that, refer back to the Canning 101 video. And you're also going to need uh, the rings to go with the jars. All right, so this is my first video canning off-grid. Uh, I have canned off-grid before, but this is my first video showing you guys canning off-grid. I'm not quite sure how this is gonna go, but what we're going to use is um, my Camp Chef propane burner. Uh, I did do a video on this when I was living on grid, and it's basically an alternative to glass cooktops because a lot of people wanna know if they can use their all-American pressure canner on a glass cooktop. Some you can, some you can't, uh, but if you wanna be really super safe, I would recommend getting something like the Camp Chef canner, uh, or the Camp Chef two propane burner. That's what we're gonna use, and that's outside, so I'm gonna take you outside, and we're gonna show you that and get that all set up for canning and you're gonna want some oil. All right, so this is the Camp Chef two propane burner. Um, why the two paint propane burner is because I typically will use one of the burners to brown ground meat on, and then I'll 
have the canner sitting on the other side, so that's why I recommend at least the two propane burner, if not the three. This is the All American 921, and uh, I had already put two inches of water in there. This two inches of water is specific to the All American 921. If you are using a different um, pressure canner, then it might require a different water amount, but for ours, it's, it's two inches of water. Now the next thing we're going to do is we're going to lube the uh, inside of the metal here with some olive oil. You can use coconut oil or whatever oil you want, but this doesn't have any kind of rings or gaskets on it. Um, so you do need to lube the inside so that it doesn't stick. Now we're gonna go back inside and start preparing our meat. So one of the questions I always get is what type of cuts do I use for canning roasts? And the answer is whatever's cheapest, whatever I can get my hands on. Uh, in the sinks behind me that I have falling out is a mix of chuck roast and round roast and whatever I can get my hands on. This actually came from a local farm. If you guys actually watch the um, Visit the Heritage Hills Farm video, at the very, very end of that video, there is a steer named Stu. That's Stu. Stu was took to was taken to the uh, the butcher a couple weeks ago, and uh, I couldn't pass up the opportunity to do some roasts. So the very first thing you want to do if you have uh, frozen beef, because that's what they do with the processor, they freeze it right away, is you're going to want to thaw it out. So you don't want to can frozen beef. All right, so the second thing we're going to do is we're gonna put our onions in the jar. Uh, the reason I do the onions first is because I don't wanna cross contaminate all the meat with the onions and all that. So I am going to cut up my onions first. And this is just a container I use for leftover onion. Just wanna slice it up, nothing fancy. And there's really no set amount. You just throw a couple pieces in the bottom of the jars. So I used about two and a half onions for all seven quarts. Uh, again, there's no set amount. It's just throw a couple pieces in the bottom of the jar. Super simple. Now, another thing that I failed to mention is these jars are clean, but they are not sterilized. Uh, you do not need to sterilize your jars per the USDA. You do not need to sterilize your jars as long as you are pressure canning or uh, water bath canning for a minimum of 10 minutes. So these jars are wiped out and they are clean, uh, but they are not sterilized. So the next thing we're going to do is we're going to uh, cut up our, our roast pieces and put them in the jar. And uh, I wanted to mention at this point that if you are using wild game, such as uh, bear or venison, you might want to soak your uh, meat in salt water for uh, at least a couple hours, if not overnight, and then make sure you rinse that out really good. That kind of tends to take out some of the gamey taste. Uh, also, when we're gonna cut up our roast, we're going to want to debone it and make sure we trim up all the fat, make sure we take all that off. If you are using something with a super uh, lean uh, fat content such as venison, you actually might want to throw a little tiny piece of um, fat in there just to kind of give it a little flavor. That's what a lot of people like to do, but don't use too much because way too much fat will prevent the jars from sealing. All right, once you get your meat uh, deboned and get all the, the fat trimmed off, you're just gonna want to take your chunks and pack them into the jar. You're gonna want to pack it pretty tight because this is a raw pack recipe that I'm showing you. And as this cooks, it's gonna cook down. So pack it in there pretty good. So there are two ways to can roast. It's either hot pack or it's raw pack. I'm showing you the raw pack method because this is what works for me. Uh, I think it's super simple and it makes a fantastic end product. The other way of doing it, just so you know, is going to be chickens are mad. 
right? They're on a diet today, and if you guys want to know why our chickens are on a diet, go check out our Instagram page. <laughs> so what I was saying was there's two ways of doing roast. You can either raw pack it or you can um, you can do a hot pack where you will cook the roast first any way you want. You can grill it or however you want until it's rare and then pack it in. The benefit of hot packing it is that it doesn't shrink down as much and it provides more liquid coverage. Um, but the benefit of doing a raw pack is it's super simple and that's the way I like to do it. So I'm showing you raw pack. If you have any bones left over, make sure you save these, put these off to the side. You can throw them in a freezer bag and whenever you're ready, you can can up some yummy bone broth. Alright, so we got our meat packed up into our jars. I did leave a one inch headspace for all of the jars, which is necessary to um, help it seal. I know a couple people are going to ask how many pounds will fit in each jar. It's approximately one pound per pint, so this would fit approximately two pounds in a quart. And um, what we're going to do right now is we're going to add our seasoning. So again, this is the Montreal steak seasoning. You can use whatever one you want, just be careful if you're using sage. You can just use salt and pepper if you want to. And we're gonna add approximately uh, two teaspoons to each one, so. Approximately that much. I, there's no real set amount. Just be careful you don't overdo it. So the meat's all packed up and we are ready to put our lids and rings on. But before I do that, I want to point out that when you raw pack any kind of meat, it is not recommended that you add any kind of liquid such as water or broth. The reason for this is because the meat is going to shrink down and produce its own juices. The downside to raw packing is this is what it's going to look like whenever it's done uh, processing. You can see that the meat doesn't produce enough liquid to completely cover the, uh, the entire product. And so the meat that is exposed is going to be a little bit darker in color than what is underneath the liquid. There is nothing wrong with this. This is perfectly edible. The top part tastes just as good as the bottom part, but for aesthetics, some people don't like the way this looks. If you don't like the way this looks, you can choose to raw, uh, to hot pack your, your meat and that will shrink, pre-shrink the meat and then you can add liquid to it up to the one inch mark and then you don't have to worry about it being only half covered. Something that is not USDA approved um, is you can choose to add a little bit of liquid to your raw pack. Knowing that this is going to not completely cover your product, you can choose to add just a little bit of boiling water or broth to your, to your product if you want to. Um, completely optional and up to you. We're not gonna do that today uh, just because I'm trying to do a training video on how to do it the right way. But if you wanted to, you could probably put, you know, maybe that much water or broth in there and that would give you a higher level of water. All right, so the next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna wipe off the rims of all of our jars. You can see there's little bits of meat and of um, spices stuck to the jars. That will prevent the lid from sticking if you don't get that off. If you're using something, if you have something sticky in your jar, such as meat, you might want to use vinegar to clean that off. Just be careful you don't double dip your rag and contaminate your jar. So you just get a little bit of vinegar on there and just wipe down the rings or the rims. And if it starts to get dirty, definitely use a clean corner before you double dip into your vinegar again.
Now we're just going to put our lids on. Now, uh, a little thing with the lids, some people like to simmer their lids before putting them on the jars. Ball, um, the manufacturer of the lids, does recommend that you do that. It just kind of softens this, this gummy and helps to seal, make it seal a little bit better. But I don't do this and I have had zero problems with, with sealing due to not um, simmering the lids. And it just saves a step. gonna put these on finger tight. And now these are ready to go into the canner. Now we're gonna put our lid on. Just make sure you line the arrow up with the little divot. Using the opposite toggles, we're going to tighten this down, finger tight. Turn on our propane. And we're going to light our burner. Now I keep the burner on about medium high and then it will need to be adjusted as it comes up to pressure. If you do not have a propane to propane burner, you can absolutely do this indoors. You just put it on your stovetop and then you do the exact same thing that we're doing here. So this is just kind of the off-grid version, but it's very similar to doing it on-grid. Uh, one thing to note is we do not put the weight, this is the weight, we do not put the weight on until this vents for 10 minutes. So right now we're gonna let this come up to pressure and we're gonna let this vent for 10 minutes. So how long do you can your roast for and at what pressure? Well, you're going to have to use a USDA approved recipe and the website that I like to use is the National Center for Home Food Preservation. This is the website that I use for all my canning times and for all of my recipes. When you go to the National Center for Home Food Preservation website, you're going to want to go to How Do I Can? Under here, Preparing and Canning Poultry, Red Meats and Seafoods. And what we're canning today is meat, strips, cubes, or chunks. And here are all the pressure canning times for both hot and raw pack and the instructions for doing both. Now on here, it doesn't mention using onions. Uh, that's just something that I do. It's not going to change the canning time at all. And what you're going to see on here are two different ways of canning. The first one is a dial gauge pressure canner and the second is a weighted gauge pressure, pressure canner. For the All-American we use the weighted gauge pressure canner instructions. Uh, if you have a different type of canner you might have a dial gauge and you might need to use these. So for both hot and raw pack we are using quartz and we're going to do that at 90 minutes. And our new location here off grid is now above a thousand feet, so we will do it at 15 pounds of pressure. All right, so our canner just started venting. You can see it and feel it when you run your hand over it. Uh, we're gonna let this vent for 10 minutes before we put the weight on. Canner has been venting for 10 minutes and now we're going to put it on 15 pounds of pressure. I have my weighted gauge on a little string here. That's the 15, that's for our particular uh, altitude. And I'm just going to place that on. You're going to start to see the dial gauge going up. This is both a dial gauge and a weighted gauge pressure canner, but we use the times for the weighted gauge. And we're going to wait till it gets up to 15. When it gets up to 15, that's when we're going to start our time. All right, we're at 15 pounds of pressure, and now is when we start our time, which is going to be 90 minutes. 
Now is also the time that we need to pay a lot of attention to this pressure gauge to make sure that it doesn't continue to climb beyond 15 pounds of pressure. And if it continues to climb, that is when most accidents happen and the pressure canners you know, can explode. You have to stay right by your pressure canner and make adjustments, reducing the temperature to keep it right around that 15 PSI mark. If it just so happens to drop below 15 PSI, you need to bring it back up to pressure and then restart your timer all over again. Not something you want to do because that can result in overcooked food. Our canner has been at 15 pounds of pressure for 90 minutes, an hour and 15 minutes. So we're just going to turn off the gas. And now we're just going to let this sit uh, until the pressure gauge goes all the way down to zero. Do not remove the weighted gauge during this period. Just let it sit. All right, our pressure gauge is now down to zero and it's now safe to remove the weighted gauge. And now we're going to let it vent for another 10 minutes. All right, our canner is done venting and it's time to take these jars out. Now here's the difference between canning indoors and canning outdoors. The temperature out here is around 60 degrees and if I were to open this up right now with it being as hot as it is in there, all these jars are going to break. So you have to be really conscious of the temperature outside and the temperature of the jars whenever you go to uh, put jars in or remove jars. So what we're going to do is we're going to take this whole entire canner and bring it in the house where it's about, it's a little bit warmer in our house, about 70 some degrees. And then we're going to open it up in there. I'm going to have Jeremy do this because this canner is super heavy. It's really, really hard for me to lift. All right, we're going to open this up by, same way we put it on, opposite toggles. And then we're going to open this away from your face so you don't get steam burnt. Just like that. And now we're going to take these out and we're going to set them on a cloth on the table. Just want to point out that I did not add liquid to these jars and this particular uh, steer was apparently a lot more juicier than some of the other ones that I've canned in the past because the liquid almost completely covered all of the solid meat in the jar. So it's actually a good thing I didn't add any liquid to this jar for, for this particular batch. Right now these jars are going to sit here on the countertop for up to 24 hours just to make sure that they cool down and everything seals. After that, I'm going to remove the rings. I'm going to wipe them down, mark the lids, what they are and the date, and then I'm going to put them in my pantry for long-term storage. And then I'm going to put them in my pantry for long-term storage. So a lot of people ask, how long do canned goods last uh, on the shelf? And the USDA will put a, a date on there of about a year. But I can tell you that canned goods have lasted us two, three years, and some people, uh, you know, 15, 20 years. The difference is, is the longer they sit, the more vitamins are depleted from the product itself. Um, so you want to eat them sooner rather than later, but they are good for several years if you wanted to. The next question is, is can you eat it right from the jar? Absolutely. These are, um, everything has been removed from them. The botulism and all that has been removed if they're canned properly. You can open a jar up and eat it. A lot of people like to be extra safe and reheat the contents up to about another 180 degrees just to make sure everything's, you know, killed in it. But I can tell you that you can eat these right from a jar. Uh, there's, it's completely safe. And the last question uh, that I know some people are going to ask is, what do you use this for? We use the large jars as a side dish. So we'll open a jar of this up. We'll put some horseradish on it. 
popping. Uh, we'll make some mashed potatoes and some green beans or something, some green side to go with it, and we'll eat it as a meal. And then we'll also can some pint-sized jars, and we'll use that for things such as sandwiches. So I hope that's been helpful to you guys. I hope you guys go ahead and try canning your own roasts. If you do, leave your comments down below. I wanna hear from you guys. I love hearing stories of people who've never canned before and who decide to try it and uh, really end up usually liking it. Uh, but if you don't, leave that as well. I uh, hope you guys like this kind of stuff. Like, subscribe, and uh, we'll have more canning videos coming out at some point as soon as I get some fruits and vegetables will probably be doing jams this this spring and summer so look forward to that coming out and uh, we'll see you in the next video thanks for watching